You want you want to start with your French experience? <laughs> sure. I was at um, something called Ars Electronica, which is a big uh, interactive digital festival they do in Linz, Austria, every year. And they br brought a bunch of us out. I was still pretty young. I had just written this book called Media Virus, which launched the whole viral media thing. And um, Paul Virilio was there. I don't know if you've heard of him. He's a very big French postmodernist philosopher, media theorist. And um, he was actually there, up there on a big screen. And um, a, another intellectual, Manuel Delanda, said um, to him, so what do you think of um, you know, Douglas Rushkoff, Douglas Rushkoff's ideas about you know, viral media? And Virilio goes, he goes, Rushkoff? He's an idiot. <laughs> And I was so thrilled. I was so pleased that first that this guy even knew who I was, right? An important French. I mean, to me, he's like Derrida, you know, one of those okay. important French uh, uh, or Baudrillard or somebody, Paul Virilio okay. is like that, um, that he knows who I am. And second, that he thinks my work is worth Ugh, that level of anger, even <laughs> just, you know what I mean? <coughs> he was like Rushkoff, ah, whatever. Yeah, 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 yeah. Who cares? Or Rushkoff, I think he's okay. That's not as good as Rushkoff. He's an idiot. And he said it with, with like enjoying taking me down to that. And I was like, my God, this is, that was the moment yeah, I that, felt. That, that, that I was very, made, that meant you were important to him in some, in some way. Yeah. And I felt that was like, I felt like I had arrived on the intellectual stage when <laughs> this important French postmodernist dis had disdain for me, meant this is great. I'm, I'm, I'm in the game. <laughs> <laughs> Did you get to talk to him after or to, to no. debate? No, 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 he wasn't actually physically there because he oh, was okay. so important. Even back then, this is, you know, the nineties, but he, uh, went in through, you know, satellite or whatever they used as the equivalent of, of we didn't have zoom back yeah, yeah. then. Yeah, I guess so. So, well, that, that, that's a nice introduction, you know, like to the, to the, your ideas, I guess, you know, like the fact that, uh, you, you say some stuff that people, you know, may disagree with, which is always a good sign, I would say. Mm. And, um, well, let's start there. You know, I always find it interesting also to start by, you know, trying to understand where ideas come from and also what glasses my guests, you know, tend to wear, you know, what are the angles? Mm. Can, can you well, briefly introduce yourself and explain to me where you are talking from, you know, what important elements, experiences or finding would you say shaped the most your vision of the world? Yeah, well, um, right now, I guess I'm a, a, I'm a media and technology theorist and thinker, um, which means looking at the impact of media and technology on people and society and culture, and necessarily looking at the way that capitalism and domination express themselves through technology, the way they get amplified by these technologies. And my, my sensibility comes from theater. I was a, a theater maker and director since I was you know, 11 years old. I, was, I got seriously involved in theater. And by the uh, uh, late 1980s, I started to get upset about theater. It was very expensive to do. Only wealthy people showed up. And theater always had a very traditional narrative arc to it. You know, crisis, climax, conclusion. I, mm -hmm, I mm -hmm. called it the male mm -hmm. orgasm curve of storytelling, where every story... Hero, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Reaches that climax and then collapse and you get to go to sleep. And I felt that audiences were, were seeing plays as a way of not taking action, as a substitute for action rather than seeing plays to motivate themselves in the world. So while I was upset with that and, and uh, uh, trying to break through to make theater more participatory and more interactive, um, the internet happened. And it was really early. I mean, it wasn't even the internet. It was computers happened. And I believed, perhaps naively, in the late 80s and early 90s, that computers and rave and the psychedelic revival and fantasy role playing and hypertext and lucid dreaming and, you know, uh, uh, states of consciousness were all part of the same cultural movement 
toward giving people more uh, power and autonomy over the creation of the reality in which they live. And while originally I thought theater was the place to experiment with reality creation, I believe that, oh, now with computers, we can reach real people and have non-elitist, non-business-like uh, uh, approach. And of course, within just a few years, business came and tried to take over the internet and used it rather than unleashing the creative potential of wild humans, um, they looked at how do we use this technology to control people, to make human beings more predictable and extract even more value from them. Mm -hmm. So for the last really 20 or 30 years now, I've been looking at that um, interplay, that dynamic, that struggle over um, the power unleashed by these digital technologies and trying to um, help people be the, the programmers rather than the programmed. Well, what I'm trying to do with this uh, podcast now for, for for five years is to investigate on you know what shapes the world, and uh, try to unpack the different structures and dynamics and to see okay why things are happening this way you know and you mentioned mm -hmm. like technology is a structure, uh, you've got the economy capitalism which is another structure with its rules and the rules uh, make makes that things happen in a certain way and then you have events you know happening that we notice etc uh you mentioned the fact that you like you started reflecting on stories and uh and on the fact that you know it's very much influential and and then technology is a way of dealing with stories and, uh, and telling stories in another way I, I would like to start there you know how would you describe today's dominant story today today's dominant narrative you know that really through technology a little bit but we'll, we'll get to that a little bit later but that is shaping the most our culture and then our lives and therefore our behavior in the west at least in the west um i think the dominant story that we're living is um you know the story that took us out of the late middle ages into the renaissance that story that we got You guys got it in France, I would say, around the time of Philip the Fair. Mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. when Philip the Fair outlawed local currencies and got the Knights Templar to kill anybody who was using them and instituted his, his bizarre central currency and kept devaluing it in order to be able to extract money from people. Um, it was really that. It's, it's that. That moment um, is when they, they uh, embedded a a set of different stories. So one of them it was that we, we live in nation states rather than city states. You know, city states were these organic uh, 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 communities of people that built around markets and needs. Nation states were artificial, you know, uh, uh, boundaries created around territories and then mythologies were imposed. Oh, you're not Venetian, you're Italian. You know, <laughs> it's like, what's that? Um, no, that's what you are. That's an, here's your myth. And that goes all the way back. That, that style of doing things went all the way back to the Torah. You know, yeah. when the uh, Israelite tribes got a myth that, oh, each of these tribes is the descendants of one brother of this one man, Jacob. And that's where we all come from. And that's why we are allowed to take this Canaan land and that's who we are. It's like, okay. Um, but myths, that's the way. So there's those, those myths. So the nation state myth combined with the myth really of, of capitalism. That's when we got uh, central currency, which is, is loaned to people at interest and then paid back to central authorities. And when we got the corporation or the chartered monopoly, so rather than people working for themselves and trading back and forth in a peer-to-peer -peer society, like at the end of the late Middle Ages when we were doing really quite well. I, we, we talk about it as if it was the Dark Ages. It wasn't. It was a very prosperous time. People were, were healthy and working three or four days a week. It was wonderful. Um, the, we, we instead got chartered monopolies or proto-corporations where now we sell our time rather than our value. So that's really the, the story that we've been living ever since. And each different field of inquiry is dominated by the same understanding of uh, uh, controlling people and getting value out of people rather than letting people um, create value and exchange it with one another. So even uh, we look at 
the birth of science. Um, you look at uh, Francis Bacon when he was uh, – same period, uh, early Renaissance, or actually mid-Renaissance, I guess, um, when when he is the founder of what we now call empirical science, and when he was selling the idea of empirical science to the uh, you know to both the church and the Academy of uh, 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 Royal Academy of Scientists, he said, you know, uh, empirical science will let us take nature by the forelock, hold her down, and submit her to our will. So science was born as a way of dominating nature. Control, I mean, it's a rape fantasy, right? Holding down nature like it's a woman, hold her down by the hair and submit her to our will. So we're living in a view of reality, in a view of the world where uh, business, technology, and science are all ways of controlling people, controlling nature, and submitting everything to our will. So we we conquer, we vanquish. That's how we got um, colonization. You colonize places. You you follow Hobbes, who said, "Don't worry about the uh, mm-hmm, uh, Native mm-hmm. Americans. They're just like trees or shrubs. You can dominate those." And I think we're still there. We still look at um, at the world, at population, at markets um, through this militaristic. Um, colonial end to win. And you look in popular culture, and this is the the Marvel movie. It it where does it go? The Marvel movie requires an end game. They even have the movie, end game, infinite, you know, end. Uh you you can only follow it to uh uh vanquishing the other side. And um that's not uh, that's not working anymore, right? That's I think we've gotten to the end of that story. Is it? Um, I would like to stay a little bit on the origins, you know, of this, because uh, just to mm-hmm. understand, do you think it's a it's a derivative of uh, Western values of you know, like the Adam and Eve myth, where you get separated from nature and then you have to populate the world and go out there and populate, reproduce and populate the world, and then it was. Reborn again with Descartes at the Renaissance, you know, in France, where you you think that with reason and then science, you can understand everything and therefore, you know, like, you, you know, see nature as something separated from us and therefore you can conquest it and dominate it. Or is it something that's kind of always been there, you know, since the beginning of civilization, where there is something inherent to civilization, uh, linked being linked to separation i don't know if you reflected on that yeah i mean there is something slightly different about humans you know that human beings are a bit more aware of ourselves and our predicament you know we're a little bit less in the moment. But I I would love, along with others, to blame, you know, white male toxicity or like Rianne Eisler, I could blame the the metallurgy, you know, the 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 uh, and the invention of the sword and chains, mm-hmm. you know, for domination and slavery that that empowered, you know, these people over those people. But I was watching the um they made a new print of um, 2001 Space Odyssey, the Kubrick movie. Mm-hmm. And, you know, in the beginning of that movie, before they go to space and all, yeah, they show the, the uh, kind yeah. of mon- monkey people. Yeah. And and they're all fighting with sticks and things and stones, whatever. But there's a um, there's a scene when the monkey people... I'm sorry for calling them that. I don't know whether they're monkeys yeah, or yeah. people. They're right in between, you know? They're all humans. Um, where the monkey people... Yeah, proto humans. It's it's nighttime, and there's like four of them sitting against a little cliff at night, awake, and you hear somewhere around them, you hear like the saber toothed tiger going, is around, and they're sitting up in fear. And when I saw that, I was thinking, how many tens or hundreds of thousands of years did our ancestors sit in fear of being eaten by something like that how uh, uh how embedded how innate ingrained is that in our consciousness and i can understand after spending a couple of hundred thousand years 
sitting up at night, worried that you're going to be eaten by a tiger, you're going to build as many walls and fences and antibiotics and other things as you can to protect against against that. It's it's really hard to it's really hard to get to a place where you say, "Okay, I feel safe enough to stop," because we're so. I feel like we're so uh, programmed is a bad word to use because it's so computery. But I feel we're so inclined to to uh, uh, remove as many existential threats from ourselves as possible. It's just now we've gotten to a place where, in the effort to remove as many existential threats as possible, we've created second order effect, second order existential threats. You know, the, 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 the walls that we created to block out the saber tooth tiger are falling on us now. <laughs> so, all right. There's a happy, there's a balance we need to strike. So, yeah, we can dwell a little bit on this because there is this, uh, I find very much interesting to start with the idea that we are, it's a great motivation in everything that we do to, um, escape that fear, you know, to, to fear of death, fear of not belonging, fear of, uh, you know, not having food. You've got like primal instincts that, uh, you know, clinic instincts that are all there. We can reflect on that. And also you mentioned the fact that we have uh, an instinct or actually we're in that culture, I don't know if it's an instinct of conquest, of going to other, other places, looking for what's next. And uh, and that yeah, we are I don't know how that's also building stories too. Yeah, right. So tell me about this. You know, like the fact know. how this that, is shaping our world today. Yeah, yeah. That instinct for uh, empire. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. How how instinctual that is, um, and it's interesting to see. And I don't know enough about everyone's history to see how that uh, how that emerges. Um, you know, I mean, Genghis Khan did it. There's people did it other than, you know, Napoleon and Western Alexander. And those, it's, it's happened in other places. There have been, you know, the Japanese uh, 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 empires. So, so it, it does, it does happen. I mean, what I'm, I'm interested in, I guess, is, is, is more how, how we come to see it as the only possibility, you know, okay. how we, when, when do we accept these rules as conditions of nature? You know, I see my, my primary job. I mean, I talk about, I've tried to do four things in my work. I mean, the first thing is denaturalize power. You know, how do we make these systems that disempower us, how do we help people see that, no, capitalism is not nature. It's one set of rules that were put in place a long time ago. You know, once, so I, my four rules, I mean, my four things I'm trying to do are to denaturalize power, to, to trigger agency, that is to make people feel like they can recode the world in which they live. You know, third is to re-socialize people, to create a uh, uh, camaraderie and and uh, 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 rapport, and finally is to to cultivate awe, a sense of awe and connection. Because when you experience awe, you no longer want to dominate the thing. You want to be, uh, uh, you want to you want to experience it. But the first thing it, to denaturalize power, you know, and that's why it's interesting. We start with history. You have to say, oh look, you know. This is not money. This is something that was invented in the 13th century by some kings who are looking to, to solidify their power in the face of a rising middle class, and they outlawed everything else. And Philip hired the knights to 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 uh, the knight Templar to to uh, uh, reinforce that. And now, because we were born in that world, that's all we see. It's like if you were raised in a world where there's only the Macintosh computer, uh, only Apple. You wouldn't know what an operating system is. You would just say that's computer, you know, <laughs> unless. So, how do we help people understand that there are other cultural operating systems available to us? That you don't need necessarily a revolution to start um, deploying new cultural strategies. So, I, I would like to deconstruct a little bit what uh, this, you know, our, our, what is shaping our um, our system of belief today because as you said it's important to to realize that there are beliefs 
that sometimes we, we tend to mistaken with laws, you know, laws of nature of, you know, or, or human construction or natural construction versus human constructions. So you mentioned the fact that we're always looking for the next thing that we, you know, as you said, after, after life, uh, there is death, but then there is paradise after, you know, when we end up and with the resources on Earth, there will be Mars. And, uh, you know, there, can, can, you, can you tell us about the importance of this narrative and uh, how this is shaping our today trajectory, according to you? Well, when, we're, we, when we use stories that have beginnings, middles and ends, we become intolerant and impatient of the middle. You know, we want... Where's my cookie? Where's my ending? Where's my orgasm? Where's my thing? Where does it, how does this end up? And we have a society now that is so addicted to endings that people would rather the world end in a fiery apocalypse than just keep going in an indeterminate way. You know, they, they, they would, they would rather believe that there's some big evil, you know, uh, conspiracy of Democrats and Jews, you know, uh, uh, sucking blood out of people who will get punished, then the world is complex. This is awful. It's tricky. We got to, you know, they, they're, which is why it's so hard to adopt a sustainable, uh, a model of sustainability, because sustainability suggests that this just keeps going. It keeps on going. You know, they can't, they can't do it. That's why I've been talking a lot lately about Tantra. I feel like if people learn Tantra, you know, how to just, it's okay. You don't have to come. It's okay. Just <laughs> stay with it. Stay with it. There's other, there's other places to explore. There's things you just don't need to get there. Um, then it would be easier. But the problem is it's the, the, the model that we have now is the, in technology is the startup model, right? You, yeah. you, come up with your idea, you raise some money, you blow it, and then you have an exit strategy where you sell the company to someone else and you leave with a billion dollars and you make, you know, a thousand X or a million X your original investment. It doesn't matter what the company does. You just pivot and keep pivoting to whatever's going to get you the exit. And then people, certainly in America, we have, um, we have no, you know, social state in America. So we, um, the object of the game is to earn enough money while you can work so that you can pay for yourself to live when you're old. That's the way it goes. Because we set it up so that old people are not taken care of. Your kids won't take you. No one's going to take care of you. Your community won't. So you have to, I mean, what creature in nature ever does this? You have to save enough food, right, while you can, while you're young so that... <laughs> You store it up and then just eat it then until you die. Um, so that creates all of the anxiety around, I need a job, I need a retirement plan, I need to save this money. And then when you save this money for your retirement, where do you put it? You put it into the big corporations because they are the stocks that will return your money. And those are the corporations that are exploiting you in the first place, that are demanding you live like this. So we all uh, play into the same narrative of, you know, this life arc, rather than, um, you know, it's really hard for people to look at one another and community as the source yeah. of, 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 of power. So I, I want to explore, you know, how, why this is problematic. Um, because, and that's related to very much also the, the structure of the tech economy today and the fact that people that are in charge, that have a lot of power, are shaped in part by these narratives so i mean i would like to start with uh, with tech because i'm not sure you know how much people that are who are listening understand how things work and how much we're influenced so today you know we spend a great share of time with i mean looking at screens interacting with algorithms and uh, and this is shaping our this is shaping our worldviews and and then our behaviors right choices can you reflect on the place digital technology in particular now occupies in our lives, how important this is, and actually how much this is changing us and shaping us and, and setting up our trajectory. You know, what, what do we need to understand about these tools and how it works that is uh, unknown to most people? Um, 
Well, it's tricky to talk about because when when we do talk about what's going on, it can sound so bad and so scary that it makes us sound or feel powerless. And I don't want to go there. So there's a, a movement in the U.S. called, you know, humane technology that some of the people who were involved in building social media and and some of the uh, more manipulative uh, platforms out there, they, you know, finally realized, oh, we're hurting people. And they decided to change their ways, right? But they they believe that they are wizards who and they believe their technologies really do control human beings and human behaviors. So now, instead of using their massive wizard magical technology powers to make people buy things, now they will use their massive powers to upgrade the human brain, you know, to nudge us to be better people. And both models are, are equally stupid, right? You don't use technology to change people. You, you, that's, that, you don't program people. You don't. We're not computers. We are living, sacred beings. Don't program. Don't program people. Um, so this, with, that, with that caveat, I guess, before, um, these digital technologies were, were potentially um, rescue us from industrialism. They, they, they mark an entirely new age, like a bronze age and, a, 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 you know, a, a digital a electronic age and a broadcast age. There's a digital age and digital is different. Digital is a symbol system. Digital is like a, a, a meta architecture. It's, it's like language. You know, imagine the first people who if you didn't know, you're a caveman who doesn't know how to speak, who doesn't know that speech exists, and you wander over to your neighboring tribe, and you see in that tribe someone goes, blah, 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 and then other people do stuff. You're going to go, wow, what's that? What is that blah, 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 blah stuff? So, right, so the blah, 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 blah is this layer. It's like software. It's a, it's a layer over reality. It's the first virtual world. Right, it's this map that people use in order. It's not the world, but it sure does influence the world. Right, digital is that big a thing. It's this other layer. It's this other platform that we use to represent reality and then to even dictate a lot of what happens in reality. So those of us who saw that in the late '80s and early '90s that we were going to build a second skin on our world a second skin of symbols, just like the people who were writing originally said, oh my God, we're going to represent the world in text, in scripture. What is that going to mean? And how does that change? And it changed everything, right? The Judeo-Christian insight of how to use, well, if we're going to have, some, if we're going to be able to write things down, let's write a contract with God. That's what the Torah is. It's a covenant. It's, let's make a deal. All right. What, are, what do you expect of us? What do we have to do for you? And let's get it down. It's a contract. Let's write our history. Let's write our future. Let's create who we are. I mean, it was really an interesting, let's write laws. We could write down laws. They're written down. Now you people got to follow it. If you go into my yard, you owe me this. You know, and they, it, it, it was, and it changed everything, right? We had now a virtual representation of our world. Well, digital is like that. So, Many of us saw it as, oh, this is an opportunity to rewrite the contracts, rewrite the contracts between workers and bosses is probably the big one, between citizens and government, that we're living in a, a, a read, what, what computer people would call a read-write universe. We used to live in read-only media, like books and television, where you could read them, but you can't change what's on TV. Computers is read-write meaning now the user can change what's up there. You can re reprogram it. Everybody can be a, a writer now. So that, that possibility was, was so powerful to those of us in the early era that we thought this is going to be interesting. We're moving into a much more consensual relationship with one another to build society as some kind of a collective organism, which is why rave of all things – 
it seems silly now to look at it, but the rave dance seemed like a great symbol for what we were doing. Instead of going to a rock and roll concert and worshiping some long haired guy masturbating with his guitar on stage. Now we're all together looking at each other. The DJ back then was anonymous. You didn't even see them. It was just music. So the, the, you're turned to other people. You're just dancing with other people. It was a different thing. And the internet seemed like, oh, wow, instead of sitting and watching TV, we're going to be in a media, artsy media dance with one another, creating reality together. Now, the problem was, of course, this was so many of us started doing it and playing with it. Big business came along. Wired magazine came along and said, oh, no, 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 no. This is not about people playing with each other. This is the best tool we have ever found for extracting value from people, right? We can manipulate people in real time. So they took really the best techniques they had from Freudian psychology, from from uh, uh, Pavlovian psychology, and they turned the internet into a Skinner box, which is a, a behavioral control mechanism. And they used everything they knew about behavioral finance, which is really just the science of how do you get people to do things that are against their own best interests, and embed these platforms with that. So on the one hand, we are empowered, you know, with a GPS in our phone to get somewhere without using a map. But on the other hand, we're disempowered now because we follow the route that they want us to take, which is the route that's going to go by the McDonald's and the Dunkin' Donuts and the, you know, what restaurants show up on the map are the ones that have paid to be there, you know, the ones that are participating in the culture that they want us to, to pay our money to. Um, and, and, and they understand that to use these technologies to make us more predictable increases their profits. The, the less outlier behavior, the less innovation, the less mutation there is among us. So it's, it's, it's serious to me that we are living on a digital landscape that most of us don't even understand how it was programmed. We are mistaking it for nature and it is designed to get us to behave against our own best interests. And the way it does that is by increasingly alienating us from one another. You know, when you make eye contact, when you engage with another human being, your whole psychology and physiology, it recalibrates to a healthier place. You know, that's your, your mirror neurons fire, the oxytocin goes into your bloodstream, you experience bonding, you experience rapport, and you're, you're stable. The existential fear goes away. When you're stuck in Facebook and Instagram and these services, they are designed intentionally to create the opposite effect, to make you feel untethered and alone and afraid and anxious so that you click on things, desperately trying to buy things and share more of your, uh, more of your data and, and behavior um, with them. So it's a very, um, it, it's, it's a powerful tool and, and one that creates a self-reinforcing feedback loop of anxiety alienation, and then more digital use. We become addicted to the digital because it doesn't work. If it did work, we'd be satisfied and then could go home and have sex. But because it doesn't work, mm -hmm. we keep clicking, find another thing, another thing. And we are now at a time where we can't afford to do this anymore. You know, we can't. We need to establish um, okay. uh, uh, that kind of a collective sensibility. Yeah, we'll, go, we'll go into that. I, I would like to understand also why this is like this. I understand that this is about making money because you want to twist people's behavior into extracting value from them, as you said, you know, attention. But, you know, like mm -hmm. this big tech, uh, big tech is controlled by just a few number of individuals, you know, mainly uh, in Silicon Valley or in China, it's different. But, you know, for, for the West, all the tools are made in the same place by the same type mm -hmm. of people, like engineer, engineers, mostly men. And they are taking decisions related to how it works, what it should do, and what it shouldn't do, right? And therefore, what these people think, believe, uh, you know, have a huge impact on, on the world. Uh, so you know that ecosystem, yeah, that ecosystem very well. What can you tell? Can you can you tell me about the that tech culture, and what you call? So I think the mindset, you know, like the system of belief 
and uh, that willingness also to go meta, you know, as you, as you say, like to, to have this layer, yeah. what for, what's driving that? Well, it's funny. Originally, I blamed capitalism. Right. So here we are. We, we have this beautiful Internet. We're trying to, you know, create a new collective consciousness with this thing. And then the business people come along. Um, and on the one hand, that's true. You know, uh, uh, we we didn't realize how powerful they would be. And there was a guy. He was actually the lyricist for The Grateful Dead um, named John Barlow who um, he wrote something called the Declaration of Independence of Cyberspace. And what the document said was, was it was, it was very seductive. It said, you know, governments of the world, you know, beware, you know, we don't need you anymore. We are creating a new space. We don't need you and your laws and your governments and your nation states. We're going to build a new thing, you know, leave us alone. And we all, we all, the counterculture embraced that. Because government had cast itself as the enemy of technology back then. I mean, they 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 were uh, the FBI was raiding the houses of hackers who were really innocent kids who were breaking into different computers. You know, but yeah. you 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 could stop them, but you don't need to like come Aaron at them with Schwartz, guns. Uh, you know, you know they, ten years, yeah, yeah. But even okay. before that, these were 14, 15 year old kids. They would break into their apartments, you know, put their family down on the ground, okay. you know, and handcuff them. You know, it was big because they were afraid. The government didn't understand what a kid, a 14 year old kid was doing with his computer. Um, so the government had cast itself as the enemy and we thought, great, let's get rid of them. What we didn't realize is if you get rid of the government, then corporate power grows. You know, that government and business balance each other in the world, a bit like fungus and bacteria balance each other in the human body. You get rid of one and the other grows rampant. So we got rid of government and then business happened. So you could look at that as the story. And then business came and used these tools to exploit people. And that's that. And then the most successful people are the billionaires. You know, so you get your Elon Musk and Peter Thiel, the libertarians. It was a libertarian a mindset that they're going to win. And that's partly true. But I remember I was with, um, I was with Timothy Leary when he was reading one of the first books about this internet world. It was called um, The Media Lab. It was written by Stuart Brand, who was a great counterculture figure from the 60s. He was one of the merry pranksters. Um, he wrote this book about MIT's new media lab, where they were starting to do digital work. And Timothy Leary, you know, great psychedelics uh, 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 patriarch, he's reading this book with a felt tip pen and he's circling things. And I'm thinking, oh, he must be loving this book. When he gets to the end of the book, he slams it and he throws it across the room and he goes, Bleh! I'm like, what? What, Tim? What happened? And he goes, first, you know, oh, less than 3% of the names in the index are women. You know, what does that tell you? And then he said, you know, these technologists at MIT, they're trying to recreate the womb. Their own mothers were unable to anticipate their every need, and now they want to build a digital mother that they can live inside who will know everything they want before they even know they want it. They can have everything, sex and food, and never have to talk to another person again. And wear pajamas and, all day. <laughs> yeah, but not really deal with real people. Right, Other people are the threat. Technology is more predictable than people and women and nature and girls and, and soil and darkness and the moon. And you know all the stuff that Francis Bacon was afraid of when he said, let's take nature by the hair and hold her down and submit her to our will, is the same stuff that these guys were. It's the same um, trajectory. So you have guys who maybe had more of a propensity towards spectrum uh, behavior who were already had some because uh, it was it was very characteristic of people who were in computers. A lot of, a lot of us, you know, have little social anxieties that maybe were a little bit magnified compared to other people. You now you have oh we can build out this utilitarian fantasy where everybody is predictable and does what they're supposed to, and you know you can kind is this of this what you um, call the meta universe, like the meta world, that layer. Well, yeah, I mean. 
in a way it's that it's that, yeah, I can rise above everybody and operate the world as if like I'm a, a puppeteer one level above. But the other thing about meta, um, you could look at these guys as perpetually really since the beginning, <clears throat> they're trying to do damage. Well, they're trying to, to dominate things, but escape the damage that they're doing themselves, you know? So, um, like the billionaires I, I spoke to who are uh, uh, yeah, I met this group into of billionaires. That, that story who, that you're telling, you know, in your letters book. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's instructive for the, for this mindset. I, I was invited to do a talk for uh, uh, wealthy um, tech investors um, and technologists. And it turned out they didn't want me to do a talk. They just brought five men into the green room where I was preparing. And they started asking me questions about their bunkers, their, their, Bunkers for the event, their doomsday. Um, you know, one of them wanted to upload his consciousness to the cloud, but most of them were building facilities in New Zealand or Alaska where they would go to after the event. So they all believed that an event was coming, either a nuclear disaster, a climate change, uh, a, a pandemic, um, social unrest, um, some kind of or electromagnetic pulse that would collapse civilization and require them to build a fortress that they would defend. And I mean, for me, I realized if the wealthy and most powerful people in the world, or at least the ones that I had ever met, they're not just preparing, but they're almost actively fantasizing for that reality. It's almost like they want that to happen. They want to escape from the rest of us. And that's what I, what I mean in a large, to a large extent by going meta. You used to be able to escape what you did by going further west, conquering more people. You know, if if you're running out of money, you find, you know, uh, uh, you know, the people of color in some area of the world that hasn't been exploited, and enslave the people, take their stuff, build some factories, and you know, call it a, a economic success. Pretend that you've developed a new place when really you've just colonized. But I feel like once we got, you know, to the end of California and the end of World War II, we really ran out of places to colonize. So digital technology became a way of creating new surface area on the market, a new place to colonize. Rather than colonizing other people, we'll colonize human attention, we'll colonize human uh, human minds. But the object of the game has always been for them to really build a car that can go fast enough to escape from its own exhaust. To how do you escape the externalities of your own processes? You keep going. And when you run out of room, when you can't keep doing that fast enough, you go meta. You rise one level above everybody else. So there's one tech billionaire named Peter Thiel who started Palantir. It's the biggest spy network. And he helped start PayPal and some other things. And he's a very strange man. But he wrote a book called Zero to One which is really purely going meta. The idea is everybody else is competing down here on the ground. If you want a successful business or a successful anything, you rise one level above them. He says one order of magnitude above them, and you create the platform on which everybody else competes. So if, if, you know, if everybody has all these little stores or something, you create the platform that aggregates those stores. You create the website that aggregates the other website. You move one level above. You know, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, when Facebook stops working, Facebook was already Web 2.0, they called it. We you know, Facebook went meta on the original web. Everybody had their own websites. So he says, no, I'm going to make a site that lets everybody build a website. It's what really a Facebook page is. That let's build their website, but it's all on my thing. So he went meta on the net. When Facebook stops working, what does he do? He starts a new company called Meta, literally meta, one step above. So he's labeling, he's labeling the idea of going meta. You know, Stuart Brand, when he was talking about the internet, he said it will let us be as gods, one level above the rest of humanity. So it's really all of these folks, even Zuckerberg, when he talks about um, what he's doing, he he his role model is um, is Augustus Caesar. 
you know, it's, it's a, that's what he does when he went on his honeymoon. That's all his wife says. He complained that all he wanted to do was look at the, the, you know, the, the artifacts of Augustus Caesar. He, yeah, his haircut is, is to look like Augustus Caesar. That's what he does. It's intentional. And we should be thankful that it's Augustus Caesar and not Caligula, right? That would be worse, but it's still a Roman dictator, right? That he's modeling himself after. And that's because they want to be a level, a level above an order of magnitude above everybody else. And that's to be safe. That's to be, as Leary said, you're safe in your digital womb, one level above the rest of humanity, architecting and directing humanity through digital symbols rather than on the ground with everybody. And that's why in the end, it requires a full escape. You upload to the cloud, you go to Mars, you move to a, a an island in the middle of nowhere that they're they understand that their impact on the world is so destructive that they are going to require a do, way out. You know, they want to literally leave do us they, behind. Do they realize this? Do they realize how much, you know, like arm they are doing, or are they actually thinking that? they are doing good or, you know, how much cynical are they related to this, according to you? Um, it depends on which one you're talking about. Some of them believe both, you know, some of them believe that they, they're doing a great thing. They're probably saving the world. But if the world is not up to the challenge, if those horrible governments don't let us, you know, replace all the cars with automatic cars and replace all the energy with our kind of energy, then and, and clone and use nano and build robots, then those poor humans are going to die. But I'm going to have yeah, they have the way, way out. out. Uh, it's always um, about so they, hedging, they, you know, hedging like the they're hedge fund people, right? So they hedge. That was what one of the billionaires I spoke to said. Look, my uh, uh, analysts say there's a 20% chance of a uh, a catastrophic event in my lifetime. So I'm spending 20% of my money mm. preparing Would for that. Would you say it's uh, that attitude, you know, like that mindset is related to billionaires or tech? You know, what shapes this the most? Because you can, you can argue also like the, That's the, the thing. meta. Both. For example, you say, I like the, the idea of going meta. Would you say, for example, something like depth is meta, is something that uh, virtual layer that we put on reality that you know does things or is just about technology in the end oh debt is definitely debt is the first i mean financialization is going meta so debt is the first layer of financialization so that you, here's these people doing business together now i can make money off the fact that they're doing business together if i charge them for the money that they're using You know, that was what Philip the Fair figured out. I'm going to charge them to use money. So I'm going to make money off every, I'm going meta on the economy. You know, that's what the stock market does. But then the stock market went meta by creating derivatives. So now you don't buy a stock, you buy a derivative of a stock. So I went meta on a stock. Now I can buy a derivative of a derivative. So I've gone meta on derivatives. In, in, in the US, the derivatives exchange became so much bigger than the New York Stock Exchange that the New York Stock Exchange was purchased by its derivatives exchange in 2013. So the stock market, which is already an abstraction of the real market, which is an abstraction of the social reality, was consumed by its own abstraction, right? That's how meta works. But So yes, it's true capitalism and financialization is purely meta, but it never had digital technology along with it. So when you marry a, a meta say, yeah. technological environment, a medical media, a, a, a meta media environment with a meta financial environment, they catalyze one another and you end up in this crazy, um, in this crazy world that we're in today. And So can you talk about team human? Is it related to that, like the confrontation of technological development, AI, and human project somehow? You know, you ended up coming up with that view that they had a kind of, a, not a fight, but yeah, a challenge between these two narratives and these two tribes, if you say. Can, can, can you explain this to me? Yeah, well, it's interesting. They My... my idea for team human came up when I was, um, 
I was on a, a like a TV special with a, a famous a transhumanist scientist named Ray Kurzweil, who's at Google. So he has Google basically building computers for him to upload his brain. That's what he wants to do: upload his 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 consciousness before he dies to the computer. And he believes that technology, digital computers, and AIs are our uh, uh, evolutionary successor that, you know, first there was atoms, then molecules, then one celled organisms and monkeys and everything else, then humans and humans have been the best, most complex organism so far, but that once computers are more complex than us, then we pass the evolutionary torch to computers and we fade into the background and we only really stay around as long as we have to, to keep the computers going. And then we can go extinct. We've, we've done our job and we should accept that that's how it goes. And I said to him, no, but I remember I said, no, human beings are special. You know, we're, we're weird. We can do some things that computers can't. We can embrace ambiguity. We don't need to resolve everything to a one or a zero. We can stay in that strange in-between space. I remember I said, a human being can watch a movie by David Lynch not understand what happened and still experience that as pleasure. You know, what is that? You know, human beings, I said, you know, human beings deserve a place in the digital future. And he said, oh, Rushkoff, you're just saying that because you're human, <laughs> right? as if it was hubris. And that's when I said, fine, I'm on team human. And the, the, I, the, the yeah. phrase, the team human uh, uh, phrase, it sort of stayed with me as like team human versus team machine, I guess, team human versus team robot. But that team human, it doesn't even have to be a versus anybody, but we are, the second meaning of team human for me was that human beings really uh, uh, only, being human is a collective activity, Right, that 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 evolution is a team sport. You're not a sole individual human. You are part of humanity. That we are together, and that no matter how much capitalism and computers try to convince us that you are an individual, right? This is a iPhone. You, have, it's an iPhone, not an us phone. It's an iPhone, right? It's your of your individual thing. You know that that this whole landscape is set up with your own user account as individuals. No, being human is a collaborative thing. What we learned in the rave dance, you know, we are an organism together. And uh, so then I started working with that and, and deciding that really anything that makes us feel or behave more alone is anti-human and anything that helps us collaborate and, and um, connect to one another is, is pro-human and that I am pro-human and that I'm trying to help people recalibrate to the, the physically scaled reality. Because everything digital, partly because they go meta all the time, everything scales up. Every company, when you evaluate a digital company, can it scale? Is it global? Even the ones who think they're saving the earth, they only want solutions that are huge. They call them you know, X prizes or moon shots. They have to be scalable or they, they won't fund it. They want to give only a hundred million dollars to one person rather than a million dollars to a hundred different people doing a hundred smaller solutions. It has to be giant, you know, so team human is about, no, 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 stop with that. Meet your neighbors, share things, you know, look into somebody's eyes, walk around, you know, that experience yourself in human scale with other people rather than thinking that you have to operate at this digital global okay. scale with, with, you know, that you need a million followers on Instagram in order to be satisfied. So how do you see this unfolding? Because you have these very powerful guys with this mindset that are already preparing for um, the end of the, you know, the collapse of the civilization. I don't really do, don't want to do anything to avoid it, even though they could a little bit, you know, somehow. And on the other side, you have, you know, Team Human and people like you that are trying to alert people on the dangers of, you know, spending too much time with technology, etc. And you have this difference in terms of, of power. And you see also states losing their power to companies or individuals 
you see uh, tensions, you know, especially in like country like in the US, but not only in the US where people don't understand each other. And that's related to the structure of technology and to the structure of the mindset, etc. What's the battlefield like? How do you see things unfold? They, and what will be the important, the most important, you know, like uh, tipping points or, or, or points of tensions that we have to pay attention to? Um, I mean, the, the, I think the most important thing or the, the initial point of attack on this problem is to, uh, help people be less afraid of one another, you know, to get people and I don't like saying that get people to do this or get people to do that because then it sounds like another um, social programming. I would say to help, I would like to build, uh, uh, I would like to build mechanisms and offer stories that engender more sharing and connection between people. So the, the solutions are much easier than we want to believe. So right now, if you're in America, let's say someone, uh, your daughter graduates high school, right? My daughter's graduating high school. And you get a portrait when they graduate, you know. All right, I want to hang the portrait on the wall. And... How I don't have a drill to drill a hole in the wall to put it. What do I do? I'm in America. I drive to Home Depot. I look for the minimum viable product drill. You know, for thirty nine, I'll go buy this piece of drill that was manufactured. You know, do, uh, the, took rare earth metals out of the ground from slaves in Africa and assembled by children in China and shipped here with all this pollution and plastic and crap. And maybe it works once, then maybe I uh, six months later I use it again, but it doesn't recharge, whatever, I throw it out. What I should do, I need to drill one hole in the wall. I should go to my neighbor's house, go to Joe's house and say, Joe, can I borrow your drill? I need to make a hole in the wall to hang a picture of my daughter. Sure, Doug. Here's my drill. And Joe's drill is nice because Joe builds things. He's like, that's why I went to Joe's house because I always see him make. Joe has a real metal drill that he got. Maybe got it from his dad or he got it from his shop. You know, and I drill this big hole. It's nice. I bring it back to Joe and just sure. Anytime, Doug. And then Joe feels welcome to say, you know, Doug, my daughter's having problems in math. You're one of those nerdy people. Would you come over for an hour and show her how to do this calculus thing? Because she can do. Of course I would. Joe, you lent me your drill. And then I go over there and then I meet Joe's wife and she cooks stuff. And I'm like, oh, my God, this is so good. Could you teach me how to cook that? And then we're friends. And then I have a barbecue and they come over. And it's like that's that's what Marx actually meant by socialism. He didn't mean what Lenin did. He didn't mean this giant spreadsheet managed nation state. Yeah. He meant that our our economic inter yeah our economic interactions were local and social. So I think that that's the beginning is to be willing to accept and ask for favors from other people. Most of us are willing to give favors to other people. The The hard part is <laughs> it really is for people to be willing to accept them because you feel like you owe something. It's transactional. Uh-oh, you know, what do I... What do I owe them for them for for them giving me this? So that's I think the beginning, and then that rebuilds the fabric of our society. It the argument against it, and I've heard this when I've done talked about this in a talk. Someone got up and said, "Well, if everybody's borrowing drills from their neighbors, what happens to the workers in the drill company? They're going to start losing their jobs. What about the old lady whose whose pension is dependent on the uh, dividend that she gets from her stock in the drill company?" And then that's the crazy thing. So you're saying that the human beings need to serve the economy at this point, that that's how important the economy is. So rather than the economy serving us, we've got to now remake our lives to serve that. And that's where 
again, where I go back to, we have to denaturalize power. We have to let people understand that the systems by which we're living were invented by people a long time ago for reasons that were very particular to their situation, but that mm -hmm. may not apply to us But now. going out to your neighbors, you know, means accepting uncertainty, accepting that you can be rejected, accepting that, uh, you know, taking the risk to, that's getting back to, people want to precisely want to avoid it in the first place now and or, or are convinced that they need to avoid it because it's uh, bad. Right. But the, but I, but for you the French we should do, understand do. this better like than anybody. <laughs> think about making love. Yeah, I know, but think about but you probably do actually. You know, you're you're one of the most uh, capitalist resistant <laughs> places that we have. Um well, you were. Um but but you think about making love. It's like Do you want to know everything they're going to do and when they're going to do it? Or isn't part of the excitement, you don't know where their hands and mouth, and you don't know where they're going to go next, right? It's, 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 that's the joy of the, the thing that we're trying to avoid, that uncertainty is actually the thrill of life. That's being alive. If you get rid of the certainty or get rid of the uncertainty, yep. then you that's may as well people, be the computer. So that's what you, you guys are talking that's, about. One in the, the end, point. you know, these, or Ray Colesford said, but but yeah, yes. there's something about that that we tend to forget, which is about when with insurances and with uh, the fear of uh, of death also in the end is to accept the fact that life is all about mess, big mess and uncertainty. And, and in the end, it's, uh, we don't know, right? So, <laughs> but, but I guess this is, this is why it's so interesting what you say about the mindset, because it's interesting to know where this all also individualistic culture that we are being brainwashed with uh, comes from. You know, all, all the fear, the original fear of being rejected, the original fear of being needy uh, and, and, I, I don't know if it's, uh, do you think this is, how do, I'm, I'm still wondering, you know, how we are going against this in a powerful way, looking at the structures and looking looking at who is in control, you know, what are, what are the... Yeah, I would say though, 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 don't be fooled into thinking that we have to respond to this at scale. It's possible that scale is the problem. So I understand we as humans say, okay, we've got to create a movement so we can fight these dragons with our own kind of giant virtual scaled avatar. But that we may always lose because that abstracted space of scale is the home field of these corporations and abstract institutions. Our home field advantage is here on the planet, is here on Earth, as we are most powerful as Earthlings, you know, as Earthlings, because that's where we live. So I would rather defend the Earth from the abstract gods that are now attacking us than try to go be an abstract god and fight for that space. In some ways, it's like, if they want the internet, let them have the internet, you know, let them have that. And let's take back take back the land, but it's scary because they're buying the land. The biggest farmland owner in America is Bill Gates right now. So, you know, they're buying up physical reality. They're buying water rights. They're buying air rights. So when they're buying their Bitcoin is what it's converting atoms into bits. They're burning the planet for their token. You know, that's where we have to fight is for, for the, 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 atoms. But where do you start it? Is it, is it starting with, I understand the, the scale thing because it's always a, uh... It's the same. You're getting back into the same game, trying trying to to go meta because you need to fight with the the same weapons. You know the same game. You know you, you always hear this also. Like we, you have to play by the rules if you want to beat the game. But do you start? Do you think this is about starting at an individual level and not first? You know, like working on yourself and not paying attention to the whole thing, or is it bullshit? You know, like again, individualistic. Yeah. yeah. Different people 
different people are going to work on different levels and write different books about different aspects of this. So, you know, my friend Cory Doctorow, a science fiction writer, he wrote a great book about choke point capitalism, looking for him. He says the place we have to work is breaking the monopolies of these companies and creating regulations that prevent them from doing this and that. And he's right. He's right. And he's out there and stumping for that. And some people will do that. You know, other people are going to teach children how to, to, you know, think about themselves and, and uh, uh, you know, do education in classrooms that doesn't involve the iPad, you know, that, that makes eye contact so that people can develop socially. I'm going to be arguing for what I argue. So there's, there's so many different approaches. There are political ones, there's economic ones, there are educational ones, you know, and I'm working on a, 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 a almost a, 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 a philosophical storytelling one that informs the work of lots of different people, you know, right now. But my main, my main message for 99% of us is that we can just do this where we are on the ground with, with people, you know, we don't need not yeah, everybody sure. needs to weigh in on every friggin' thing. Not everybody needs to understand how the you know the startup economy works because they're they they we will take the power away from Walmart and Amazon simply by sharing things with each other. You do more. Ninety nine percent of us will do more by by aiding one another than you know posting Facebook posts about what's wrong with Amazon's uh, business strategy. What, what, what gives you hope the most today when you look at the trajectory in the world, what's going on around you? Um, If anything. <laughs> yeah, um, I guess what gives me hope is how young people will use whatever is at their disposal to uh, uh, nurture one another. You know, they really will. That, that, yes, there's all the bad things happening on all the social networks and everything, but I remember when um, Ariana Grande did this concert in uh, Manchester mm -hmm. a few years ago, yeah. and someone bombed, threw it a bomb in there. And some people died. It was really bad. And I saw my daughter was young when that happened. And I saw all the girls on TikTok and Instagram were all consoling each other in such a positive way and deciding to use this to manifest something else. They all talk about magic and manifesting. And, um, and I look and I go, you know, it doesn't matter. You know, I had some of the best experiences of my life in the parking lot behind the 7-Eleven. It's a horrible little grocery we have in the U.S. So you find, you know, love and hope and social and creative uh, uh, urges find a way wherever, you know, wherever it is. So, so uh, I have faith in, in young people and all people's ability to use many of these platforms and tools against their Uh, original intentions, you know, just as, as, as Ivy will grow on a, on a cement building, I feel like culture will grow on almost anything if given half a chance. Last questions, two books that had the most impact on your life and that anyone should read. Um, Cosmic Trigger by Robert Anton Wilson. Uh, it's a book about his journey through what he called the Chapel Perilous you know, where you, you start to see the connection between things and need to determine whether th things are connected because you're seeing a real pattern or are you being paranoid or both, right? Um, and it's, an it's important. If people had that experience, they wouldn't be becoming QAnon, you know, QAnon crazy people, conspiracy theorists. They would see that, oh, there are patterns, but they're not. They're, it's both. They're right, but they're not. Um, so that, and, um, sorry, but, um, Torah, you know, the, 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 what, or, or, you know, what you would call the, you know, the Bible, um, the old Testament Bible, but Torah in particular, because Torah is the story of how 
humanity became enslaved by an artificial concept like debt and then how they broke free of it by destroying their own idols. That's what the plagues are, is the desecration of, the, of their own gods. Um, and it's a really interesting thing because it helps us understand where are we on that trajectory of enslavement and liberation. You know, I would, when I look at that story, I would say, oh, we're right about the time of the first plague again. That's sort of where we are in that story. And it means that we're going to the desert soon, you know, and what do we want to prepare for the desert? What do we need out there to take into the next uh, civilization? So uh, uh, those are two, that had, uh, those are the two stories that were the, kind of the Well, I thank so much, Douglas. Deepest ones. Thanks for your time and your, and your insights. Thanks for what you do. Thanks for your, your openness. It's very sweet.